Here's our model of the hippocampus. You can see we have input going into entorhinal cortex. This is just the direct activation one-to-one -one of what we assume are large-scale representations of activity throughout the cortex. We're simulating the ABAC task. We've organized the input patterns and the entorhinal cortex and the CA3 into stripes or slots. Um, these are like hypercolumn level structures that uh, we hypothesize uh, organize the pathways so that the CA1 can learn a invertible combinatorial code such that neural activity patterns up here can encode what's happening in entorhinal cortex and then reproduce that back down on the entorhinal cortex output there. The first three patterns uh, or, or slots uh, are the A item, the next three are the B item, and then the back six are the context, this list context, very similar to the previous ABAC model. And unlike the ABAC model, the entire pattern is presented as a single input pattern just is essentially taking a snapshot or memorizing this entire pattern and then later we'll present just the A portion of the pattern and see if the model can actually fill in the B portion. So as we go through you can see the network is encoding each of these different patterns. Uh, you should observe that the dentate gyrus has extremely sparse levels of activity very few neurons active for a relatively large number of total neurons. This is the extreme pattern separation part of the hippocampus and uh, kind of a pattern separator turbocharger. And it's very effective in reducing the overlap among all the different patterns. This then projects strong inputs into area CA3 which has much higher levels of activity and encodes a kind of rich distributed pattern, but because of these dentate gyrus inputs, it's actually uh, quite separated and distinct for each different input pattern. Uh, and then as we noted before in the overview, the major association for these patterns takes place between CA3 and CA1 this kind of gluing together of essentially this kind of hash code pattern separated version of this input with the invertible representation in CA1 that can then reconstruct the output pattern. At the, at the end of each pass through all of the training items, um, we test the network on its ability to fill in the missing piece. So now we're gonna trace through the activity of a test item that has the A input the context for the AB list, and we can see that now directly activating EC in, it goes, the information goes from EC in up to, through the dentate gyrus, up to the CA3, and this is where now the CA3 is starting to fill in with the recurrent connections, the connections, the lateral connections among the neurons in CA3, fill in the complete pattern from this partial cue this is now also filling in to CA1 and activating the pattern in CA1. You can see initially it's just reproducing what we see in the input, but as more of that starts to fill in, we get a kind of a completion, a filling in of the missing part of the pattern, which is happening both as a, as a result of the lateral connections uh, connecting among CA3 neurons, and also as a result of the kind of big loop of activity flowing through this uh, whole loop of interrhinal CA3, CA1, interrhinal, um, that establishes essentially a, a nice baseline for further filling in the missing pieces, which you can see, see start to fill in here in the, e, in the CA1. They're a little bit slower because they're not receiving the kind of bottom-up support. Um, but as those fill in, they reverberate through into the entorhinal pathway, and that also leads to a new round of the large loop, the big loop filling in. And ultimately, at the end of this 
entire process, the network has completed or filled in uh, a B item that was not presented during test, but was present during training. And that's how we measure the recall. We score how many of the correct units are active in this recall pattern. Um, and also it may sometimes erroneously recall patterns uh, units and so those are also scored as errors and you can see that here uh, recording how many neurons were correctly activated and we also score a green line here the mem line telling us whether or not uh, based on those error measures the network is considered to have retrieved the item we can now monitor the process on this test epoch log and as we step epoch by epoch we can get a total summary of the number of items that were scored as being retrieved according to those error measures and you can see even after just one pass through the items it got about 50 percent correct and now with the second pass through the items we're up to maybe 90 percent correct and keep going here and as with the ABAC model once it gets to 100% correct it will now switch automatically over to the AC list and so that's what we're seeing now it got to this 100% level now we're seeing the AC items coming in and as with the previous model we're going to be looking at the extent to which it can still retain memory of those original AB items which it is no longer being trained on. And now you can see after a few more epochs of training the network has gotten to 100% on the AC items and still retains uh, maybe 60% uh, roughly speaking on the AB items. So this means that the network is actually matching the human data quite well. You'll also notice that the rate of learning is very fast. This is because we have a fast learning rate. That's only possible to do that if the network is doing this pattern separation because we're changing those synapses a lot. And if we didn't have the pattern separation, that fast rate of learning would produce a lot of interference. So you can only really set that fast learning rate if you're doing this extreme level of pattern separation. Okay, we're going to rewind the network and look at how learning works. This network is using an error-driven learning mechanism actually in both the entorhinal cortex CA1 pathway and also in the CA3 pathway. This new error-driven learning in CA3 is actually a relatively new development in this model. So first we're going to just look at uh, as the information comes in, this is again during training, so it's a complete pattern. Initially, the network is actually paying attention to the entorhinal cortex inputs in CA1 and using that information to drive uh, the corresponding pattern of activity in the output layer. It actually has downweighted the strength of the connections between CA3 and CA1. And uh, so that means that its initial, the first sort of quarter of training is focusing on this en encoder pathway in EC and CA1. So there's the end of the first quarter. Then we turn on the connections from the CA3 to the CA1 and Michael Hasimo in his lab has uh, discovered mechanisms by which the relative strengths of these connections actually should be changing. He's measured them changing in the hippocampus. So this is not, uh, this is based on his original work demonstrating these kind of pathway different specialized modulations. So he basically discovered these key mechanisms and we just showed how they could do error driven learning in this model. So now this is the pattern of activity associated with uh, what the connections from CA3 to CA1 say. And then finally, uh, we have a plus phase, the error-driven kind of plus phase learning, where the entorhinal cortex output layer uh, 
is driven by the pattern of activity in ECN. This is the correct pattern of activity to kind of fill in the missing pieces. And we now have uh, essentially a minus phase from the prior state of activity and a plus phase from this state of activity that drives error-driven learning. Furthermore, in the CA3 version of the learning mechanism, prior the first quarter of settling, the first 25 milliseconds of settling, is driven directly from the ECN to CA3 pathway. And then, uh, after that point, uh, the dentate gyrus inputs with this highly high level of pattern separation are uh, increased in strength and drive activity in CA3. And so that difference between what was initially present based on the direct connections versus what happens now with the dentate input is also an error-driven minus plus phase learning signal. And essentially the CA3 is learning to do the pattern separation that is otherwise provided by the dentate is essentially the, the plus phase signal in its own direct connections, both from the ECN and its own lateral connections within the CA3 layer itself. And using this error-driven learning mechanisms throughout the network turns out to be really important for minimizing the overall amount of synaptic change while still getting the network to learn effectively to produce the patterns. So as we saw in the learning chapter, error-driven learning is always the most efficient, effective way of learning these problems.